Chapter forty seven of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty seven. Early next morning, a firing was heard in the direction of Torcy, and springing on my horse, I galloped off for the scene of action as fast as possible. Before I came up, however, the firing had ceased, and I found my troop under arms in the hamlet where I had left them, though the village itself, not above five hundred yards in front, was in the hands of the enemy. A regiment of infantry, which Monsieur de Bouillon had thrown forward into the village of Torcy itself, for the purpose of covering his bridge of boats, had been attacked, it seemed, by the advance guard of the enemy, and after a sharp struggle, had been driven back upon the hamlet behind, from which Garcias had made a very brilliant charge upon the pursuing parties of the enemy, repulsed them with some loss, and compelled them to content themselves with the village they had taken. As may be imagined, I was mortified at not having been present, but I expressed to my troop my high satisfaction at what had been done, and told them, in a brief harangue I made them, on the occasion, that His Highness the Count de Soissons reckoned greatly upon their valour for success, and that, therefore, he proposed to entrust to them under my command some of the most important manoeuvres which had already been determined upon. Praise was perhaps the more palatable to them, as their bravery had been attended with no loss, and as they had driven back the enemy at the expense of a few slight wounds. Loud cheers, therefore, attended me as I rode with Garcias along their ranks, and these were repeated still more loudly when the commanding officer of the infantry rode up to Garcias, and thanked him for the very successful diversion which my troop had operated in his favour. Finding that the enemy did not make any disposition for advancing farther, which would indeed have brought them almost under the guns of Sedan, I rode into the town to inform the Count of what had occurred, and after a brief interview with him, I delivered the letter for my father into the hands of little Achilles, and taking with me all my papers, I bade adieu to my little attendant with feelings that perhaps do not often exist between master and servant, and returned to my troop for the night. Before joining them, however, according to the commands of the Count, I reconnoitred the position I was to take up in the morning, and passed by the pillar from which the signal was to be given. It had formed part of an old Roman arch, and probably had recorded some victory of those wonderful barbarians, the Romans, over their still more barbarous enemies, the Gauls. But as I looked at the broken fragments of the structure they had probably raised, in the fond hope of immortalising some long-forgotten deed, the thrilling feeling of man's mortality, of the mortality of all his works, the mortality of his very fame, came coldly over my heart and i turned away repeating to myself some of the lines which my dead friend father francis of Alourdi had once cited glory alas what art thou but a name and returned to the post assigned me thinking of what might be in another world towards six o'clock a heavy rain began to fall but that did not prevent me from having several messengers from the count de soissons one bidding me make good the hamlet which i occupied at all risks another informing me that lamboy with the germans and the cannon had arrived and would pass the next morning early and the third giving me orders to quit the hamlet as silently as possible before daybreak the next day and to take up the position assigned to me this last command made me order my men to rest as soon as possible and I also threw myself down upon some straw, completely armed except my cask, and after giving about half an hour to some vague wandering thoughts regarding the morrow, I felt that thought was of no use, and addressed myself to sleep. The fear, however, of not waking in time abridged my slumber to two or three hours, and rising, I went out of the hovel in which I had been lying, to ascertain by the appearance of the sky what o'clock it was all was dark and silent though i could hear at intervals the neighing of the horses in the enemy's army and could see the long line of dim watch-fires half extinguished by the rain which marked where the veteran lamboy 
had taken up his ground on the opposite hill shortly after the clocks of sedan struck midnight and i resolved to give my men yet an hour's sleep that they might be as fresh as possible the next day it was an hour of the deepest and most awful thought for me every one must feel the day before he risks his life in mortal combat sensations that assail him at no other time the eager anxiety to know the issue the doubt if not the fear of the event the thought of earth and all that earth has dear the calculations of eternity all that is awful in our vague and misty state of being then presses on the mind and he is the brave man that looks upon it without shrinking but my feelings were deeper and more exciting than those of most men because my all was staked upon that battle if it should be won the count de soissons would be master of the councils of france the only remaining obstacle between helen and myself might easily be removed rank wealth power affection were all within my grasp and never did my heart feel what love is so much as it did that night but if the battle were lost i had no longer anything to live for home and country and station and love and hope were all gone and i resolved that life also should be cast upon the die it seemed but a minute since twelve o'clock had struck when one followed it by the clocks of sedan so busy had been the ideas that hurried through my brain but action now became my duty and waking garcias we proceeded to take the necessary measures for decamping in silence no men in the broad universe could have been found better calculated for every motion which required secrecy than my three hundred they provided themselves with forage and provisions for the next morning mounted their horses and rode out of the hamlet without even disturbing the regiment of infantry that lay beside them and the only person i believe whom we woke out of his slumber was a weary sentinel who without the excuse of mercury's wand had followed the example of argus and fallen asleep upon his watch woke suddenly by our passing he seemed to think the best thing he could do was to fire his piece and accordingly snapped it at my head but luckily the priming had fallen out while he slept and it missed fire i seldom remember a more unpleasant ride than that from torcy to the heights of the marfay the rain had come on more heavily than ever the whole way was a long broken ascent traversed by ravines and often interrupted by copses and the ground was so slippery that our horses could scarcely keep their feet we passed it however after much difficulty and there was some consolation in knowing that the enemy's army would have to vanquish the same obstacles before the battle if they dared to attack us day began to break heavily as we reached the wood without any sign of the rain abating but the smaller detached part of the forest behind which we were posted formed almost entirely of old beeches gave us better shelter than we could have hoped on our arrival i found that the count according to his word had already detached a company of musketeers to take possession of the copse wood between us and his main position and had also sent forward several tumbrils with provisions and ammunition in plenty together with these was a letter for me containing some farther orders and a very ample commission under his hand by which i found that the infantry beside me were also placed under my command as we were all new troops there was no jealousy respecting seniority of service and i found the officer of the infantry well disposed to act with me especially as all i required was for his own security it appeared to me that the copse in which he was placed was of much more importance than had been attached to it as in case of the enemy possessing himself thereof which would have been easily done by advancing through a hollow way to our left the left flank of the prince's force was completely exposed to render it then as defensible as possible i proposed to the other officer to employ our spare time in throwing up a strong breastwork of earth and boughs before it and all our men setting to work with great eagerness before seven o'clock we had completed a line which placed it in comparative security towards eight the rain ceased and for the rest of the day merely came down in occasional showers it had been hitherto so thick that the line of the Meurs 
and even the town of Sedan, had been scarcely distinguishable, but now it drew up like a curtain, and I could see the troops of Lamboy descending towards the bridge of boats, and gradually passing the river, in a fine, unbroken order, as if on a review. Shortly after, the bridge of Sedan began to be occupied, and pennons, and plumes, and standards, and flashing arms, and all the pageantry of war, announced that the princes were on their march to form the junction with the imperial army my eye then turned anxiously towards torcy but all was still in the camp of the enemy and i saw the two allied armies approach near and more near and then unite unopposed and seemingly almost unnoticed winding in and out of the ravines and over the hills the army of the princes now began to mount towards the heights on which I was stationed, and it was near nine o'clock before the report of a cannon announced that the Maréchal de Châtillon intended to take any notice of their movements. No time, however, was now to be lost, and making my men refresh both themselves and their horses, I waited impatiently for the arrival of the army. All sombre thoughts, if I had entertained any such before, now vanished like mists before the sun the sight of the moving hosts the recollection of all that was that day to be won the thoughtless aspiration which all young minds have for glory the love of daring natural to my character all stimulated me on the onward path and slow slow did i think the approach of the forces as winding their way over the wet and slippy ground they advanced towards the position which they proposed to take up. For some time, as they came nearer, I lost sight of them in the hollow way. But a little after ten the advance guard began to appear upon the heights, and took their ground, with the left resting upon the copse. Regiment after regiment now presented itself, and I could see them, one following another across the underwood, defile to the places assigned to them, but lost them, one by one, in a few minutes after, behind the wood of the Marfay. The sounds of the trumpets, however, the loud commands of the officers, the crashing and creaking of the ammunition carts, all assured me of their proximity, and in a few minutes after, one of the prince's equerries rode up to ascertain that I had arrived, and to tell me that no alterations had been made in the dispositions of the day before. I pointed out to him the work we had constructed, and in a short time afterwards he returned, by the prince's express command, to thank me, and inform me of his high approbation of what had been done. While we were still speaking, the enemy began to appear on the opposite slope, and in a moment afterwards a discharge of artillery from beneath the hill gave notice that the battle was commenced upon our right, where the infantry of Lamboy, were still making their way up to the heights. The sound of the cannon, so much nearer to me than I expected, I will own, made me start, but springing at once into my saddle, lest any one should see fear in what in truth was but surprise, I rode round alone to a spot where, through the trees, I could see what was passing in the hollow. The smoke of the cannon greatly impeded my sight, but I could perceive a body of the enemy's pikemen in the act of charging the German infantry, who were borne back before my eyes near two hundred yards, but still maintained their order. Every step that they yielded, my heart beat to be there, and lead them back to the charge. But then again, I thought that if I might be permitted to charge the flank of the pikemen with my men-at-arms, I could drive them all to the devil. At that moment my eye fell upon a group of officers gathered upon a little knoll, in the front of whom was evidently the Count de Soissons, dressed in a suit of steel armour I had seen in his apartments, and accompanied by an elderly man in German uniform, whom I concluded to be Lamboy. The Count was pointing with his leading staff to the retreating infantry of his left wing, while the other seemed to look upon the whole with the utmost composure. In a moment after, an equerry set off from the Count's party, and a company of our musketeers instantly wheeled upon the flank of the pikemen, and drove them back under a tremendous fire, while the Germans again advanced and took up their positions as before. The smoke of the musketry now interrupted my view in that direction, 
and turning round i found that i had insensibly advanced so far as to be out of sight of the pillar from whence the signal was to be displayed riding back as fast as i could i rejoined my troop but no signal had yet been made and as i looked up towards the hill where i expected every moment to behold it displayed all was clear calm and quiet offering a strange contrast to the eager and deathful struggle upon which i had just been gazing we shall not be long now garcia said i riding up is all ready he assured me that it was and passing along from man to man i spoke a few words to each telling them that the infantry had already repulsed the enemy and that we might soon expect to be called upon saying everything i could think of to animate them to exertion and beseeching them not to let the love of plunder induce them to separate before the battle was completely gained they all made me the most solemn promises in the world not to lose their discipline to which of course i attached due credence believing it to be just as probable for a tiger to abandon bloodshed as for them to resist plunder even for a moment a vigorous and effective charge however i knew to be the great object desired and i doubted not from their whole tone and bearing that they would effect it as well as i could desire in the meanwhile the din increased we could every now and then hear the dull measured sound of the charging horse mingled with the continued firing of the musketry and at intervals a discharge of cannon while the smoke rolling over the wood reached even the spot where we stood and made me fearful lest i should lose sight of the signal pillar every minute i thought the sign must be made and no language can express the impatience i began to feel as the minutes flew by and it did not appear the firing appeared to me to grow less and i felt angry that the battle should be lost or won without my presence no longer able to bear it i rode on about twenty yards to the corner of the wood the whole scene was covered with white wreaths of smoke but the greater part of the attacking army was now displayed upon the same plain with ourselves and i could see that the battle was far from concluded though the attack of the enemy upon our position was languishing and his troops considerably broken and disordered small parties of horsemen separated from their regiments were scattered confusedly over the plain groups of men on foot carrying the more distinguished wounded to the rear appeared here and there through the smoke aides de camp riding from spot to spot and officers endeavouring by bustle and activity to reanimate the flagging energies of their soldiers were seen hurrying about in all parts of the enemy's line and i looked upon the whole scene as i have often done upon a disturbed ant-hill where i have seen confusion and hurry in every member of the insect populace without being able to divine their operations or understand their movements column after column as i stood and watched was brought up against our battalions but each after a discharge of musketry turned off as from a stone wall not three hundred yards from me was a dense mass of cavalry and i could see its officers endeavouring to animate their men to the charge at that moment i looked back the red flag was displayed from the pillar and spurring back to the head of my troop i led them out from the wood their impatience had been nearly equal to my own and as the whole field of battle opened before them with all the thrilling and exciting objects it presented they gave a loud and cheering hurrah which seemed to be answered by a flourish of trumpets at the very same moment from the cavalry of the duke of bouillon that just appeared above the hill about a quarter of a mile from us the flourish and the shout acted as a signal of concert the moment sufficed to put my troop in order and pointing onward to the enemy with my sword while my heart beat so as almost to deprive me of breath i gave the word charge onward we galloped like lightning treading i believe on many of the dead and dying in our passage the ground seemed to vanish under our horses feet the open space was passed in an instant nearer and nearer and nearer as we came each individual adversary grew into distinctness on our eyes we passed the flat like a cloud shadow sweeping the plain we reached the brow of the descent and hurled down the side of the slope upon the flank of the enemy 
like an avalanche upon a forest of pines we bore them headlong before us charged at the same moment by the duke of bouillon in front and surprised by our headlong onset from so unexpected a quarter the enemy's cavalry were borne back upon their infantry their arms and fled many of the cavalry turned their reins and galloped from the field and though some fought still hand to hand it was with but the courage of despair for the army of chatillon was by that one charge thrown into complete rout one officer in full armour seemed to single me out and not willing to disappoint him i turned my horse towards him parrying a blow he was making at my neck just above the gorget i returned it with a full sweep of my long heavy sword it cut sheer through the lacings of his casque which another blow dashed from his head when the face of a young man presented itself whom i immediately remembered as the somewhat hasty youth i had seen with monsieur de chatillon in paris will you quarter said i never replied he aiming another blow at my head but at that moment combelet de carignan who was behind me fired a pistol at him the ball of which passed right through his head he sprang up in the saddle his sword fell from his hand and his horse freed from the rein galloped away wildly over the field i had no time to see farther what became of him though when i lost sight of him in the confusion the horse was still rushing on and the rider though dead i feel sure still in the saddle but by this time although all had passed like lightning my troopers were far before me and notwithstanding the endeavours of garcias to keep them together were separating and pursuing the flyers one by one i hurried forward to unite my efforts to those of the brave spaniard but just as i came up a small peloton of the enemy's infantry that had kept together near some valuable baggage gave us one parting volley before they fled and to my deep regret i beheld garcias fall headlong from his horse springing to the ground i raised his head on my knees and saw that the bullet had gone through his corslet just above the lower rim jesu maria cried he opening his eyes from which the light of life was fleeting fast jesu maria i am afraid you are badly hurt garcias cried i more painfully affected by his situation than i could have imagined i am dying senor muttered he in spanish i am dying thank you for your care your kindness it is vain i am dying oh senor francois derville that unhappy man do you remember how i slew him at the mill i wish i had not done it i can see him now oh i wish i had not done it santa maria ora pro the heavy cloud of death fell dully down upon the clear bright eye fire and soul and meaning passed away and garcias was nothing i bade my servants who were still with me carry him to the rear and springing on my horse again galloped forward to see if i could restore some order to my troop by this time however all was confusion the field was scattered with small parties of horsemen riding here and there and cutting down or making prisoners the few of the enemy that remained nothing was to be seen but heaps of dead and dying masterless horses flying over the plain cannon and wagons overturned long files of prisoners and groups of stragglers plundering the fallen while part of the village of chaumont appeared burning on our right and towards the left was distinguished a regiment of the enemy who had still maintained their order and were retreating over the opposite hill fast but firmly the rear rank was seen to face about every twenty or thirty yards and by a heavy regular fire drive back a strong body of cavalry that hung upon their retreat gathering together about twenty of my men i rode as fast as i could to the spot and arrived just at the moment the enemy faced and gave us a volley if i may use the expression it made our cavalry reel and more than one empty saddle presented itself but what engaged my attention was to behold in the officer commanding this last regiment of the enemy the chevalier de montenero 
as i was gazing at him to assure myself that my eyes did not deceive me the duke of bouillon rode up and demanded where were the greater part of my men in a tone that did not particularly please me they are where the greater part of your own are my lord replied i some dead some plundering some following the enemy if that be the case rejoined he sharply you had better go and join them yourself for monsieur de l'orme and half a dozen men are no service to me you speak rudely monsieur de bouillon replied i and methinks on a day of such victory as this you might conduct yourself differently to one who has shared in the dangers of the struggle whether he shares in its advantages or not the duke's visor was up and he coloured highly but without waiting for reply i turned my rein and rode away my men who had only followed me in the hope of more fighting seeing me leave the spot where it was going on turned to the trade they liked next in degree and separated to plunder as before without caring how much they employed themselves for the moment i rode back towards the spot where i had before seen the count de soissons and pushing my horse up the hill i saw him still posted on a little eminence with a group of his officers and attendants at the distance of about a hundred yards behind him he seeming to enjoy the sight of the field he had won and the others apparently discussing with some animation the effects that had lately passed silence had now comparatively resumed her reign for though a straggling fire might be heard from time to time mingled with distant shouts and cries the roar of the battle itself was over the ground between me and the prince also a space of about a hundred and fifty yards was clear and unoccupied but being upland it of course delayed my horse's progress happy happy had i been able to have passed it sooner just as i was mounting the rise a horseman dashed across the top like lightning reined in his horse a moment before the count i heard the report of firearms the horseman galloped on and i saw the prince falling from his horse the noise called the attention of those that were near and when i arrived they had gathered round the count and were untying his casque but all that presented itself was the cold blank face of the dead above the right eyebrow was the wound of a pistol ball which must have gone directly into the brain and the brow and forehead was scorched and blackened by the fire and smoke of the pistol so near must have been his murderer thus died louis count de soissons in a moment of triumph and victory triumph turned to mourning victory rendered fruitless by his death End of chapter forty seven Chapter forty eight of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty eight. Ah, Monsieur De Lorme, cried de Riquemont, the prince's first equier de la main, as I galloped up, here is a dreadful catastrophe. Monsieur le comte, I am afraid, has accidentally shot himself. Twice during this morning, I have seen him raise the visor of his casque with the muzzle of his pistol and i warned him of the event no de riquemont replied i no the count has been murdered look at his pistols you will find them charged as i rode up the hill i saw a horseman pass him i heard a pistol fired and beheld the count fall i saw a horseman ride away also cried one of the attendants he wore a green plume and his horse which was a thorough barb had a large white spot on his left shoulder i know him i know him then replied i and i will avenge this on his head or die so saying i turned and galloped down in the direction which the horseman had taken without seeing or caring whether any one followed me or not certain that the assassin had betaken himself to the hollow way i felt sure that whether he went straight forward or crossed over the hill i must catch a glance of him if i rode fast i was mounted on the noble horse the unhappy prince had himself given me and as if feeling that my errand was to avenge his lord he flew beneath me like the wind i was just in time for i had scarcely reached the bottom of the glen when i saw a hat and green feather 
sinking behind the hill to the right i spurred across it in an instant and at the distance of about one hundred and fifty yards before me in the ravine below i beheld the same horseman i had but too surely marked before now galloping as if he well knew that the avenger of blood was behind him the ravine led into a road which i was acquainted with from de retz and myself having followed it on our return from sedan to paris it was the worst a fugitive could have taken for it had scarce a turning in its whole length and once we were both upon it the chase of the assassin became a matter of mere speed between my horse and his they were as nearly matched as it is possible to conceive and for more than four miles which that road extended i did not gain upon him forty yards at length however the path was traversed by a little river bar broad and spreading but scarcely deeper than a horse's knee the bridge was built of wood old and insecure and he that i pursued took the river in preference in the midst his horse's foot slipped and fell on his knees his rider brought him up but the beast was hurt his speed was over and before he had gained twenty lengths on the other side i was up with him and my hand upon his bridle rein turn villain turn murderer cried i and prepare to settle our long account together this day this hour this moment is either your last or mine by my faith monsieur de l'orme replied the marquis de st brie for to him it was spoken you hold very strange language but you had better quit my reign my attendants are within call and you may repent this conduct are you mad from whatever accident it happened his attendants were evidently not within call or he would not have fled so rapidly from a single man while he spoke also i saw him slip his hands softly towards his holsters and in another moment most probably i should have shared the fate of the count de soissons but before he could reach his pistol i struck him a violent blow with my clenched gauntlet that dashed him from his horse i sprang to the ground and he started up at the same moment laying his hand upon his sword draw draw villain cried i it is what i seek draw doubtless replied he with a sneer that he could not restrain even then while at the same time fury and hesitation were strangely mingled in his countenance doubtless when you are covered with a corslet and morion and i am without any defensive arms that difference shall soon be done away cried i casting away my casque and unbuckling my corslet while i stood between him and his horse and kept a wary eye upon him lest he should take me at a disadvantage but he had other feelings on the subject it seems for before i was prepared he said in a faltering tone you have told me yourself that whoever seeks your life shall die by your hand the combat with you is not equal fool cried i fool you a murderer and an infidel are you superstitious but draw and directly for i would not kill you like a dog think of the noble prince you have just slain think of the unhappy bagnol the proofs of whose innocence and your treason are now upon my person ha cried he suddenly drawing his sword have at you then you know too much at all events tis time that one should die so saying he waited not for me to begin the attack but himself lunged straight at my breast the struggle was long and obstinate he was an excellent swordsman and was besides better armed for such an encounter than i was his sword being a long toledo rapier while mine was a heavy-edged broadsword which would thrust it is true but was ponderous and unwieldy i was heated too and rash from almost every motive that could irritate the human heart he had sought my own life he had taken that of one i loved and esteemed he had snatched from me all the advantages of success and victory at the very moment they seemed given into my hand thus anger made me lose my advantage and it was not till a sharp wound in the shoulder taught me how near my adversary was my equal that i began to fight with caution and coolness 
the glaring of his deadly eye upon me showed me now whenever he meditated a thrust that he fancied certain and i could perceive as he saw the blood from my shoulder trickle over the buff coat i had worn under my corslet a smile of triumph and of sanguinary hope curl his lip as his faith in the astrologer's prophecy gave way a wound in his neck soon turned his smile into an expression of mortal wrath and making a double feint which he thought certain he lunged full at my heart i was prepared parried it instantly lunged before he could recover and the hilt of my sword knocked against his ribs while the point shone out under his left shoulder he felt that he was slain but grappling me tight with the last deathly clasp of an expiring revenge he drew his poignard and attempting to drive it into my heart wounded me again in the arm with difficulty i wrenched it from him and cast him back upon the ground where after rolling for a moment in convulsive agony and actually biting the earth with his teeth he expired with a hollow groan and a struggle to start upon his feet so keen so eager so hazardous had been this strife that though i became conscious some spectators had been added to the scene of combat i had not dared to withdraw my eye for an instant to ascertain who they were when it was ended however a voice cried out nobly done bravely fought pardi one does not see two such champions every day and turning round i found myself in presence of an old officer accompanied by another little man on horseback together with about twenty musketeers on foot and now pray tell us sir demanded the officer who you are and whether you are for the king or for the princes i can save him that trouble interrupted the little man who accompanied him riding a step forward and exposing to my sight the funnel-shaped boots the brown poor point and the keen inquisitive little countenance of my old persecutor jean le hableur this monsieur le chevalier he continued is monsieur le comte de lorme the dear friend and ally of his highness the count de soissons and one of the chiefs of the rebels and let me tell you that you had better put irons on both his hands and his feet for a more daring or more cunning plotter never tied an honest man to a tree in a wood i shall certainly use no such measures against so brave a soldier as this young gentleman seems to be replied the officer nevertheless you must surrender yourself a prisoner sir he added without you can show that this old man speaks falsely he speaks truth replied i do with me what you like i am very careless of the event from your despairing tone young sir observed the officer i conclude that your party has lost a battle and that chatillon has gained one so far from it replied i that never did any one suffer a more complete defeat than the maréchal de chatillon this day his cannon his baggage and his treasure are all in the hands of the duc de bouillon and he has not now one man upon the field of battle but the dead the wounded and the prisoners god of heaven cried the old officer deeply affected by the news sir you are surely too brave a man to tell me a falsehood i speak the truth upon my honour replied i and more i warn you that if you do not speedily retreat you will have the cavalry of the prince upon you we must take you with us however answered the other some one look to the young gentleman's wounds for i see he is bleeding my sword was now taken from me my wounds were bandaged up as well as the circumstances permitted and being placed upon my horse i was carried to the end of the road where i found that the soldiers who had made me prisoner were only the advance party of a regiment that had been hurrying to join the army of the king the old officer with whom i had spoken was the count de Langereau their commander who having heard the distant report of cannon together with the rumours which spread fast among the peasantry had ridden forward to gain some farther information and had come up just before the death of the marquis de saint brie the regiment immediately retreated to la chaine and during the time i remained with it i was treated with every sort of lenity and kindness by its commander but this only lasted for a day 
for the maréchal de chatillon having joined the regiment at le Chêne, and collected together the scattered remnants of his army sent me prisoner to mezieres under a large escort making me appear by his precautions a person of much more consequence than i really was probably thinking that a prisoner of some import might do away in a degree the humiliating appearance of his defeat perhaps however i did him wrong but i must confess at the time i could see no other object in sending me from rethel to mezieres under a strong detachment of cavalry at mezieres i was consigned to a small room in the chateau which though not a dungeon approached somewhat near it in point of comfort and here plenty of time had i to reflect at my leisure over the hopelessness of my situation with the death of the count de soissons every dream of my fancy had died also and all that i could do was to turn my eyes upon the past and brood despairingly over the delights of the years gone by with thoughts cold unfruitful agonizing as the spirits of the dead are said sometimes to hover round the treasures they amassed in their lives at once regretting their loss and grieving that they had not used them better thus hour after hour slipped away each one a chain of heavy painful minutes gloomy desolate death-like my jailer was a jailer indeed for several days he continued to bring me my food without interchanging with me one word and his looks had anything in them but consolation at length on the seventh morning i think it was he came with another like himself bearing a heavy set of irons and told me i must submit to having them put on my legs and arms of course i remonstrated against the degradation urged my rank and asked the reason of the change because you are condemned to death replied he that is enough is it not condemned to death i exclaimed without a trial it is false it cannot be you'll find it too true when they strike your head off replied the jailer and without farther information left me to my own thoughts i had before given up life it is true i had fancied that i cared not for it now that i had lost all that made life dear but nevertheless i found that the love of being lingered still and that i could not think without a shudder on the fond fellowship betwixt body and soul being dissolved for ever for ever the very word was awful and that fate which i had ever shrunk from which i had often dared in the frenzy of passion or the folly of adventure acquired new strange terrors when i viewed it face to face slowly advancing towards me with a calm inevitable step while i sat thinking upon death and all the cold and cheerless ideas thereunto associated a gay flourish of trumpets was borne upon the wind jarring most painfully with all my feelings the sounds came nearer mingled with shout and acclamation and applause and then the evident arrival of some regiments of cavalry took place in the court of the chateau where i was confined for there was the clanging of the hoofs and jingling of the arms and the cries of the commanders and all the outcry and fracas of military discipline during the whole day the noise continued with little intermission and though i would have given worlds for quiet quiet was not to be had it was about four o'clock and the rays of the summer sun were gleaming through the high windows of my prison kindling in my bosom the warm remembrance of nature's free and beautiful face when the jailer entered and told me i must follow him i rose and being placed between two soldiers i was marched through several of the long passages of the chateau as fast as my irons would permit to a small ante-room where being made to sit down upon a bench i was soon after joined by one or two others manacled like myself here we were kept for some time with guards at all the doors and the jailer standing by our side without affording a look or word to any one at length however the sound of persons speaking approached the door of what seemed the inner chamber and as it opened i heard a voice which however unexpected there i was sure was that of the chevalier de montenero the sound increased as he came nearer 
and I could distinctly hear him say, "'Your eminence has promised me already as much as I could desire, "'the enjoyment of my fortune and my station in France. "'All else that you could properly grant, or I could reasonably request, "'depends, unfortunately, upon papers which are, I am afraid, lost irrevocably, "'and I have only to thank you for your patient hearing and the justice you have done me.' as he spoke the chevalier came forward accompanied as far as the door by richelieu himself who seemed to do him the high honour of conducting him to the threshold of his cabinet monsieur le comte de bagnole said the minister to my infinite surprise and astonishment addressing by this name him whom i had always been taught to call the chevalier de montenero what i have done is nothing but what you had a right to claim your splendid actions in this last campaign prove too well your attachment to the king and the state for me to refuse you every countenance and protection in my power to give and believe me if the letters and the marriage certificate you allude to can by any means be recovered everything that you could wish will be rendered easy in the meantime the king's gratitude stops not here we look upon the safety of the greater part of the army to have depended upon your exertions and we must think of some means of rewarding it in the manner most gratifying to yourself you will not leave mezieres for a few days before then you shall hear from me the chevalier or rather the count de bagnole took his leave and withdrew without casting his eyes upon any of the wretched beings that lined the side of the ante-room my heart swelled, but I said nothing, and in a moment after was myself called to the presence of the minister. He was seating himself when I entered, and as he turned round upon me, very, very different was the aspect of his dark, tremendous brow from that which I had beheld on another occasion. The heavy, contemplative frown, the stern, piercing eye, the stiff, compressed lip, the blaze of soul that shone out in his glance, yet the icy rigidity of his features all seemed to say, I am fire in my enmities, and marble in my determinations. And well spoke the inflexible spirit that dwelt within. When I thought over the easy flowing conversation which had passed between me and that very man, his unbent brow, his calm philosophizing air, and compared the whole with the iron expression of the countenance before me, I could scarcely believe it had been aught but a dream. "'Well, Sir Count de Lorme,' said he, in a deep, hollow tone of voice, "'you have chosen your party. You have abandoned an honourable path that was open to you. Of your own free will you attached yourself to treason and to traitors, and you now taste the consequences.' your eminence replied i calmly for my mind was made up to the worst is too generous i am sure to triumph over the fallen i am so answered richelieu and therefore i sent for you to tell you that though no power on earth can alter your fate and you must die yet i am willing that any alleviating circumstance which you may desire should be granted you in the interim i have heard replied i that no french noble can be judged without being called for his own defence it is a law not only of this country but of the world it is a law of reason of humanity of justice and i hope it will not be dispensed with for the purpose of condemning me you have heard truly sir replied the cardinal no one can be condemned without being heard except it can be proved that he has knowingly and intentionally fled from the pursuit of justice he is then condemned and is termed par contumace it was not at all difficult to prove your flight and you were condemned by the proper tribunal together with the duke of guise and the baron de beck you are the only one yet made prisoner and though perhaps the least guilty of the three the necessity unfortunately exists of showing them by the execution of your sentence that no hope exists for them have you anything to ask merely replied i that time and materials may be allowed me to write some letters of great consequence to my family and others what time do you require demanded richelieu 
the day of your execution rests with me name your time yourself but remember that if you ask longer than absolutely necessary for the purpose you have mentioned you are only prolonging hours of miserable expectation after all hope of life is over i had now to fix the day of my own death it was a bitter calculation but running my eye through the brief future i tried to divest my spirit of its clinging to corporeal existence and estimate truly how much time was necessary to what i wished to accomplish without leaving one hour to vain anticipations of my coming fate three days replied i at length will be sufficient for my purpose be it so said the minister and taking a paper already written from his portfolio he proceeded to fill up some blanks which appeared to have been left on purpose i knew that it was the order for my execution and my feelings may be better conceived than described as i saw his thin pale fingers move rapidly over the vacant spaces fixing my fate for ever till at last with a firm determined hand which spoke irrevocable in its every line he wrote his name at the bottom and handed it to the jailer who stood beside me and advanced to receive it have those fetters taken off said the minister in a stern tone as he gave the paper you have exceeded your duty see that the prisoner be furnished with writing materials and admit any of his friends to see him one at a time father let his comfort be attended to as far as consistent with security remove him his tone his manner admitted no reply and as he concluded he turned away his head while i was led out of the cabinet and carried back to my cell while the jailer after having taken off my irons went grumblingly to seek the materials for writing which he had been directed to furnish my thoughts flying even from my own situation reverted to the title by which the minister had addressed the chevalier de montenero the count de bagnole was it could it be possible that he was that count de bagnole said to have been assassinated by order of the marquis de saint brie at first i could hardly believe it but as i reflected the conviction came more and more strongly upon my mind every circumstance that i remembered showed it more plainly he himself had first told me the tale of his own supposed death and that with a circumstantial accuracy that any one but a person actually on the spot could hardly have done he had remained for years living under an assumed name probably because he had not the papers necessary to establish his innocence of the charge the marquis had brought against him i had just heard the minister allude to those very papers from achilles i had learned that the count's fortune had been transmitted to spain and the viceroy of catalonia had told me that the chevalier was not a spaniard i had also overheard the marquis de saint brie only a few nights before declare that he had seen in the royal army some one whom he had believed dead many years and to whose supposed death he was evidently in some degree accessory to no one could what he had said be so well applied as to the count de bagnole undoubtedly then the chevalier de montenero the man whom perhaps of all others i esteemed the most on earth but whose good opinion i had lost by a succession of inexplicable misunderstandings was one and the same with that count de bagnole the separate incidents of whose story had come to my knowledge by a thousand strange accidents whose fate had always been to me a point of almost painful interest and whose most important documents were still fortunately in my hands i had now then the means at once of clearing myself of all suspicion in his eyes and of conferring on him the means of equally showing his own innocence to the world true that i could never see the happiness i knew i should give him true that his good or bad opinion could serve me no longer upon earth but still there was the consolation of knowing that my memory would remain pure and unsullied in his eyes and that the benefit i had it in my power to confer would attach feelings of love to my name and regret to my loss surely the wish to be remembered with affection is hardly a weakness 
the warrior's or the poet's hope of immortality on earth the laurel that binds the lyre or the sword is perhaps the most daring yet the emptiest of all imaginative vanities but there is something holier and sweeter in the dream of living in the love of those that have known us it is indeed prolonging attachments beyond the grave and perhaps derives its charm from an innate feeling in the breast of man that friends part not here for ever as soon then as paper and ink were brought me i sat down and after writing my last farewell to my father and a few lines expressive of my deep and unchangeable affection to helen arnaud i proceeded to sketch out for the count de bagnole the history of my unfortunate adventure at saragossa i told him the promise i had entered into never to disclose the circumstances to a spaniard and showed him that as long as i had believed him to be such my lips had been necessarily sealed i pointed out to him the mistake which garcias had committed i related to him my rencontre with jean baptiste and farther as briefly as possible i gave him the outline of everything which had occurred to me since we had last met up to the moment that i wrote and having told him how i had avenged him on the marquis de st brie i enclosed his papers which i had always kept about my person lastly i begged him if i thereby rendered him any service if i had ever held any place in his esteem if i had by that explanation at all regained it to see my father and bearing him my last farewell to entreat him for my sake to look upon helen as his child to remember how i had loved her and to love her for her love to me and now wishing him personally all that happiness in his latter years which had been denied to his youth i bade him an eternal adieu this cost me all that night and the greater part of the next morning but by the time that my jailer visited me my packet was prepared and showing him some louis the last i had about me i promised them to him if he would deliver that letter to the count de bagnole if he was still in the town bringing me back an acknowledgment that it had been received in less than an hour he returned and gave me a paper written hastily in the hand of the chevalier it only contained i have received a packet from the count de lorme bagnole i gave the jailer his promised reward and he left me End of chapter forty eight Chapter forty nine of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty nine. Shortly after the jailer had quitted my chamber, a priest came to visit and console me, and after a long conversation, he also departed, promising to see me again next day. His arguments and reasoning were, I believe, very commonplace and delivered with no great eloquence or talent but i was then very willing to lend myself to any one who would lead my ideas from the world i was about to quit to a better one beyond not that i entertained a doubt upon the subject but i was glad by dwelling upon the idea of a life to come by giving it a more tangible essence and being by lending conviction the more brilliant colours of imagination to forget the regrets that attached me to this when he had left me a sort of drowsiness fell upon me which i received as a friend also i had as i have said sat up the whole of the night before writing and the irritation of my two wounds which had never been dressed since i arrived at mezieres had greatly exhausted me the approach of slumber therefore was an unexpected blessing and without farther preparation than merely laying my head upon the table i fell asleep the battle of earthly hope and fear was over in my bosom and like two inveterate enemies that had slain each other they left a dead void calm in place of their long and agitating conflict my sleep then was not like that of a child light and balmy oh no it was more like the sleep of death profound still feelingless it wanted but the fall of the one irrevocable barrier 
to have been death itself i was awoke abruptly by someone touching me and starting up i was caught in the arms of the chevalier de montenero i should say the count de bagnole a thousand thousand thanks cried he my friend my benefactor my more than son oh louis no words can speak the joy the satisfaction the relief your letter has given me not alone from the packet it contained though i have been seeking it for long and weary years as the only means of recovering rank and station and honour and casting back his accusation on the villain's head who wronged me but more far more from the proofs it brought forward that the man on whose high principles i had staked my estimate of human nature for ever was not the villain i had been misled to believe the count was here interrupted by the jailer who had remained standing near the door with his immense bunch of keys still in his hands come come grumbled he in his dogged surly tone you can tell him all that monsieur le comte in another place as you have brought the youth's pardon and the order for his release you had better take him away for i never met one yet who liked to stay here and i want to do the room we shan't be long without some other thank god the words i heard fell dully upon my sense i heard the sound and it startled me but i received from it no defined meaning that i could understand and believe it is true louis it is true said the count de bagnole your pardon is granted and you are no longer a prisoner you owe it not alone to me however the duke of bouillon made your enlargement and security one of the several points without which he would not lay down his arms i applied to the cardinal at the very moment that that point was about to be refused two concurring motives produced more than one could have done he yielded and you are free but upon the condition that you instantly return to berne and do not pass its boundaries for one year peace is now concluded to-morrow the duke of bouillon will be here and in the evening i myself set out for bigorre you shall journey with me and i shall have the happiness of restoring you to the arms of your father willingly replied i but before i go i must see the Maréchal de chatillon and inquire after helen arnault i left her in circumstances which required explanation see her i know i cannot for she was going to leave paris but i must and will ascertain where she is and how i may hear of her monsieur de bagnol you have yourself felt and can i trust understand my feelings i do my dear louis replied he but to see the marechal is quite impossible for he is at this time nearly a hundred leagues from mezieres but leave all that to me i know him well and shall have to send a messenger to him myself therefore i may safely promise you that by the time you arrive at lourdes you shall have every information you desire this was hardly satisfactory but i had no other course to pursue and therefore yielded though it cost me no small pain once more to quit the vicinity of her i still loved so unabatedly without being able to satisfy myself of her fate i have bound myself to tell both the good and the evil in my history and i must here acknowledge that a gleam of satisfaction came over my mind when i thought that the youth whom i had seen with the marechal de chatillon and to whom i hesitated not to attribute the quality of helen's lover could no longer pursue his suit it was a selfish satisfaction enough i am afraid and i reproached myself for it as soon as i felt it it was a base ungenerous triumph i thought over the dead and i would fain have scourged it from my breast but it was in vain i could not chase it away it was there in my heart a part of my humanity and i found it impossible to banish it from my bosom from the prison the count conducted me to his dwelling and after a night's delightful repose repose of mind and of feeling as well as of the mere body i rose the next morning refreshed and disposed to view my future prospects with a brighter eye than i had even done the night before 
still helen formed a part of them all reality in this respect lent hope no aid for i remembered my mental promise to my mother and i felt that i could not that i dared not break it it was a contract between me and the dead from which no living voice could absolve me yet still i hoped and a dreamer from my infancy both by nature and habit i never felt the gay but baseless architecture of my fancy rise more splendidly than when hope without any earthly basis but supported alone by her own pinions commanded my work and her willing slave imagination found bright materials in the air before departing from mezieres i begged the count de bagnol to send a messenger to sedan desiring little achilles to join me at the chateau de lorme and as he had in his hands upwards of a thousand crowns belonging to me i doubted not that armed with that magic wand money he would get through his journey quite as well though somewhat more slowly than any of the ancient magicians either mounted on hippogriff or enthroned in flying chair a horse had been prepared for me as well as every other thing i could need by my friend but as the news of my enlargement and pardon had spread through the town of mezieres where the regiment of m de lagnerolles who had made me prisoner then was he generously sent me back before my departure the beautiful charger which had been given me by the unfortunate count de soissons and i own that few things he could have bestowed would have borne so high a value in my eyes for the memory of the manner in which he had been bestowed at first added a thousandfold to the noble beast's intrinsic worth towards two o'clock we began our journey not as i had often ridden with the chevalier de montenero alone in unostentatious comfort unpursued by a crowd of useless attendants his restored rank hampered with an inconvenience like every other long coveted gratification of the earth required him to lay aside the freedom of an inferior station and followed from mezieres by twenty armed horsemen we took our way back towards Bern. scarce a hundred yards from the gates of the city we were met by the duke of bouillon and his train going according to the terms of amnesty to renew the homage they had so lately cast off to the crown of france he reined in his horse on perceiving me and approaching saluted me gravely but politely i am happy monsieur de lorme said he to see you at liberty and am glad that this accidental meeting gives me an opportunity of thanking you for your cooperation on a late occasion and of expressing my sense of your gallant services to the cause in which we were then both engaged somewhat better than hurry and an impatient disposition permitted me to do when last we met mention it not monsieur de bouillon replied i the memory of one to whom we were both sincerely attached would of itself have banished any momentary irritation from my mind long ago even if i had not been made acquainted with the generous care you had taken to provide for my security after a casual word or two farther upon the same subject we took leave of each other and parted and i pursued my way in company with m de bagnole during the first day's journey the count ceased not to question me upon all the little minute points of my story and i filled up all the blanks in my tale with the same frankness which i have done in telling it here i showed him all my feelings and all my thoughts all that i had wished and all that i had done he dwelt particularly upon my unfortunate adventure at saragossa i was wrong louis certainly very wrong said he in suspecting you of such a crime and i owe you some reparation which doubt not shall be made however if you remember that i saw you enter your own house that night when every witness you brought forward swore that you had never quitted it you will see that i had some cause for suspicion i had been engaged myself with my banker in reading over some very old accounts concerning the sums which my intendant arnaud had transmitted to saragossa many years before and i discovered therein so many frauds and villainies that i came away sick with human nature i saw you enter your lodgings as plainly as i see you now but judging you engaged in some intrigue into which it was neither my business nor my wish to inquire i passed on 
the circumstances that followed gave a new character to my suspicions and finding the high ideas which notwithstanding all your faults i had entertained of you suddenly cast down i treated you with haughtiness and impatience when it would have been better to have shown kindness and confidence at the same time let me say that for years arnaud for purposes i now understand had been labouring to undermine you in my opinion and though i have since discovered him to be as bad a man and as daring a villain as ever existed and suspected him even then yet the suspicions he instilled into me remained on my mind being confirmed by other events at the time which i could not doubt however he added with a smile i suppose i must not express what i think of arnaud so strongly or i shall have your love for the daughter in arms against me still whatever fortune he has and as you say it must be considerable has been robbed from me i was silent for every word that connected helen and arnaud in any way together went painfully to my heart cutting through all my hopes the count i believe saw he had hurt me and turned our conversation the next day to his escape from the assassins of the marquis de st brie there are circumstances even now said he after a lapse of more than eighteen years on which i dare not let my thoughts rest do not suppose i allude to pains and griefs time has softened those but i speak of the happiness that i enjoyed for a brief space which whenever i think of it awakens every pang in my heart i had as i remember to have told you on a former occasion made my escape from the prison in which i had been confined on the accusation of the greatest villain that ever i believe the earth produced i had prepared everything from my flight into spain with all that i held dear on earth my wife when on the very night that it was to have taken place as i entered the park i was attacked by four hired bravos attached to the villain st brie resolved to sell my life dearly i defended myself with desperation till at length i fell with a severe wound in my side and while i was on the ground received a blow on my head which effectually stunned me the assassins then carried me down to a stream that ran not far from that spot and threw me in as they thought lifeless but the very plunge in the water recalled my senses and i was making some faint efforts to swim when i was drawn out by two of my followers whom i had left waiting at a cottage below their approach scared away the assassins and though so weak that i could not stand and delirious from the blow on my head i was put into a litter and borne away to spain by my attendants and a friend who having brought about my escape from prison would have risked his own life if he had stayed the news of my death was general my estates of bagnols which could not be sold were sequestrated and given to the marquis de st brie i was arraigned and condemned on my non-appearance and as i slowly recovered from my wounds i heard that the last tie between myself and france was broken my wife was dead in a former embassy to madrid which terminated in the marriage of anne of austria to our present king i had become personally known to king philip and it was proposed to me to enter the spanish service to which i assented on the engagement never to be employed against my native country with a part of the money transmitted beforehand to saragossa i bought the small estate of montenero and took that name abandoning the one under which i had known so many misfortunes i was sent with the forces to new spain and had many opportunities of distinguishing myself rose high in station and amassed without either avarice or extortion a large i may say an immense fortune but it gave me no happiness in fact i had personally no use for it i was both a soldier and somewhat of a cynic and consequently not very inclined to waste wealth either in show or in luxury still i had a most passionate desire to revisit my native country many other circumstances also combined to carry me thither the hope of re-establishing my character and name which in the first bitterness of my griefs i had slighted grew upon me with the years 
and i directed arnaud to whom i still paid a salary to make every inquiry and effort to recover the papers i had lost offering a reward which might have tempted a prince no one i have discovered knew so well as he did where to find them and when after seeing your encounter with the marquis de saint brie i betook myself to spain lest i should be discovered before the proofs of my innocence were procured he not only found them but sent them to me by your good friend father francis of alourdi who as you may remember lost them on the road the manner in which the count's papers had been lost now instantly flashed across my mind after my adventure with the gamblers at luz i remembered to have met with the pretended capuchin as i mounted the stairs the door of father francis's chamber was open and the papers had been enveloped in the same cover with some pieces of gold the matter was evident enough the baffled sharper had indemnified himself for his failure in cheating by a little simple robbery and having stolen into the good priest's room while he slept had filched from his baggage the packet which to the tact of his experienced fingers seemed most valuable and having made what use he thought proper of the gold it is probable that seeing the papers were of some consequence he had kept them about him in hope of accident turning them to account till he was killed in his attempt to murder me when it may be remembered the papers were found upon him i communicated my supposition to the count who agreed with me entirely but my interruption seemed to have acted upon his story much in the same manner that don quixote's did upon that of sancho panza for he ceased there and would not again resume it saying with a smile that he had really little more to tell except that anxious to re-establish his fame he had through some great interest he possessed in the army and from the pressing necessity which the government had lately experienced for troops obtained permission under his assumed name to levy a regiment at his own expense and had commanded it at the battle of the marfe the result of which i already knew avoiding paris we now approached berne with as long journeys as we could make each day and oh what a crowd of thrilling mingled emotions hurried through my bosom when from the hill behind po i again beheld the grand chain of the purple pyrenees spreading far along the horizon robed in that magical garment of misty light which makes them seem something too beautiful for earth oh my native land my native land bound to my heart by every sweet association of youth by all the opening ideas that infancy first receives welcoming every new impression as a joy by every glad thought by every pure bright feeling then thou ceasest to be dear most dear to me the lamp of memory must be extinguished and the past all darkness indeed from po we sent forward a messenger to announce our coming to my father and the next morning early we set out for lourdes i will not attempt to embody in words what i felt during that ride my sensations were so confused so sorrowful in some respects and so painfully joyful in others that i could not separate them even at the time both the chevalier and myself were silent and the only words which i believe passed between us were when on entering lourdes i begged him to ride on while i turned my horse towards the old church of the assumption in which stood the tomb of the counts of bigor i entered the church there was no one there and passing into the little chapel where the monument stood i read over some letters that were freshly chiselled in the marble they recorded the death of my mother and leaning down my head i poured upon them the tribute of my heart's best feelings i remained long there longer than i had intended but i found a calm and a consolation in the sad duty that i rendered which cleared and tranquillized my feelings as i came out of the church i found a number of the peasantry near the door gazing on my beautiful horse which i had ridden during the last day and had tied to a cypress while i went in they all recognized me but divining the employment in which i had been engaged they did not speak but doffing their bonnets let me depart in silence 
proceeding somewhat slowly on the road i suffered the chevalier to arrive some time before me certain that my father would understand and appreciate the motives of my delay gradually however the chateau with its towers and pinnacles became visible every old accustomed object every well-remembered scene yet in the few months of my absence so many great and important events had occurred to me so many thoughts had hurried through my brain so many feelings had left their impression on my heart that i almost wondered to find everything still so much the same and had it been all in ruins should have scarcely been surprised so many years ay years seemed to have elapsed since i beheld it in the court all the old servants pressed round me and overwhelmed me with their caresses some wept and some laughed and some with the old feudal affection kissed my hand so that i was glad to escape from them as soon as i could to the saloon to the saloon monsieur cried old doucet as i broke from them and ran into the house to the saloon then i turned my steps threw open the door and entered but what was it i beheld there was but one person there a young lady in deep mourning holding as if for support by the arm of one of the antique chairs it was helen my own helen and in a moment she was in my arms and clasped to my heart with a paroxysm of overflowing joy that for the time swept every dark idea away before it oh louis dear louis was all that she could say and what i said heaven only knows but where are they cried i at length where is my father in his library awaiting you replied helen but my father kindly thought that our first meeting had better be alone and therefore he bade me stay here but now let us come to him your father helen said i some chilly feelings coming over my heart that i dared not tell her is your father here certainly replied she he is in the library with yours but come dear louis come and leading the way with a light step she ran on to my father's apartments the door of the library was open and gliding forward she threw her arms round the count de bagnols exclaiming my dear father louis did not know that you had arrived nay more helen replied the count he did not know till this moment that you were my child louis forgive me if i did not tell you this before it was not believe me from one remaining shade of doubt but it was that i wished you to hear tidings that i was sure would give you joy from the lips i believed i knew to be dearest to you on earth they flashed through my brain at once the thousand circumstances which if i had entertained any suspicion would have long before shown me the whole truth at the same moment however i found myself clasped in the arms of my own father and the happiness of meeting for some time interrupted all farther explanation the explanations that were to be given me were nevertheless many from comparing the dates of helen's age with the certificate i had seen of the count's marriage it was evident that the countess must have died in giving her birth on this however her father never spoke perhaps it was too painful a theme for him to touch upon he told me however that he had never himself learned that he had a child till he was in new spain when arnaud communicated it to him knowing that thus fresh sums of money would naturally flow into his hands he took care also that no doubt should exist upon the count's mind respecting the truth of his statement by sending him the proof of helen's birth obtained from the abbess of the convent wherein the countess had died he thus gained his object the child was consigned to his care by her father who could not for the time quit with honour the service in which he was engaged and arnaud received every year large remittances for the education of his charge which he applied of course to his own righteous purposes at length the count returned and hurried on by the strong impulse of paternal love ventured to cross the frontier he found that his intentions had been anything but fulfilled arnaud it is true had taken the child from the convent 
where her mother had died the abbess of which very willingly resigned her as old monsieur de verne had now given his whole soul over to the dominion of mammon and refused even to pay the pittance required for her support the procureur too had brought her up as his own daughter but education she had received none it may easily be imagined that the count was not a little indignant at this neglect but arnaud denied having received greater part of the sums that had been transmitted to him and an examination of his accounts was likely to have followed which might have shown his character to his lord in its true light my mother and myself however arrived as i have detailed in the first part of this book on our visit of gratitude while the count was in his house and arnaud to turn away the threatening storm proposed to my mother to substitute helen in place of jean baptiste whom she had offered to receive into our family the count though charmed with the new arrangement resolved not to lose sight of the treasure he had regained and directed arnaud to purchase and repair for him the house in which he afterwards resided it is probable that the worthy procureur had he seen any prospect of gain would have betrayed the count to the government but m de bagnol had left his fortune still in spain and as for obvious reasons he continued to employ his former intendant the only profit likely to accrue to arnaud was to be expected from his lord's life and security in the meanwhile the count easily foreseeing the likelihood of an attachment springing up between myself and helen applied himself to watch my opening character and to instil into my young mind all the great and noble principles of his own where he succeeded and where he failed must be judged of by the foregoing pages that he did fail in many instances i am but too painfully conscious by this time arnaud ever fertile in schemes where wealth was to be won aware that the count had not communicated her birth to his daughter who was still too young to be entrusted with such a secret had laid the somewhat daring project of marrying his son to mademoiselle de bagnols doubtless imagining that his knowledge of the count's secret threw more power into his hands than it really did there were many obstacles however to overcome the two greatest of which were the likelihood of my winning helen's love and the timidity and disinterestedness of jean baptiste who still be it remarked believed helen to be his sister having forgotten with the days of his childhood her first coming to his father's house on discovering helen's birth and probable wealth to his son arnaud found him deaf to the voice of interest but he contrived to influence him by other feelings and at the same time that he blackened my character to the count de bagnols he took advantage of helen's gentle kindness towards her supposed brother to persuade the good youth that she was in love with him as helen grew towards womanhood the count for many reasons thought it fit to inform her of her birth but by various circumstances his communication was delayed in the meanwhile my journey to saragossa took place and the unfortunate adventure in which i was there engaged and the count influenced by the suspicions to which that adventure gave rise instead of making me the bearer of a message to my mother and his daughter informing them of his real rank and of her birth as he had once designed entrusted the charge to good father francis of alourdi who perished in the snow at the very moment he was about to communicate it to me to helen however the count wrote on hearing of the good father's death and beginning to entertain more than doubts of arnaud's probity he procured the delivery of his letter through the smuggler garcias at the same time hearing of an intimacy between my family and the marquis de st brie he enjoined his daughter to maintain the most profound secrecy upon the subject jean baptiste had now suffered himself to be persuaded that helen loved him and the sudden dispersion of his golden dreams by overhearing the acknowledgment of her affection towards me ended as i have related in a fit of passion which had nearly brought about his own death arnaud nevertheless resolved not to abandon his scheme while a chance of success remained he saw that the count's confidence in him was gone and knew that a thousand accidents might occur to bring about a full discovery 
and complete his ruin his only hope therefore was in the success of his plot being the only person but jean baptiste who knew the real cause of my flight he spread about the report that i had carried off the daughter of a bourgeois of lourdes who had in fact been seduced by the marquis de saint brie the count de bagnols had by this time returned from spain and one accusation falling on me after another he resolved to remove helen from the chateau de l'orme viewing with as much apprehension the chance of a union between her and me as he had once regarded it with hope and pleasure having given up all expectation of recovering the proofs of his innocence and his daughter's legitimacy he took measures to let the cardinal de richelieu know that he was still in life and received the assurance that he might live peacefully in france and that no farther proceedings would be instituted against him if he continued under an assumed name he wished however to do more and setting off for paris with helen he took up his abode in the hotel of his cousin and ancient companion in arms the Maréchal de chatillon when one night passing through the streets in the carriage of the Maréchal, his attendants found me lying senseless by my fall from the window i was born to the hotel de chatillon and what passed there is already written the motives which induced the count not to see me himself and to deny to his daughter's utmost entreaties but an interview with me of a few minutes may easily be understood as well as his having caused me to be removed during my sleep to my own lodgings to which my traiteur's bill found in my pockets by the good nun who acted as my nurse furnished the address finding his villainy discovered and fearing that restitution might be called for arnault had delivered lourdes from his presence a few days before the count carried helen with him to paris there the procureur also arrived and as soon as he discovered the absence of his former patron who had by this time joined the army he resumed his former designs and endeavoured to carry helen off his purpose was as i have shown frustrated by the information i received from jean baptiste who had by this time fallen in love himself with the pretty little attendant of the countess de soissons and was besides heartily ashamed of having yielded in the former instance to his father's schemes what ultimate object arnault had proposed to himself in taking helen from her father's protection never distinctly appeared for though not many months after jean baptiste brought a bride to lourdes and was as a reward for his integrity installed in his father's place as intendant to the count de bagnols yet he could give us no farther information his father having concealed the particulars of his plan even from him arnault himself we never saw or heard of again and it seemed evident that he had fled his country in fear of the proceedings which the count instituted against him the last news we received of him was from helen herself who had seen him watching under the porch of the convent of the minim as she set out for pau on the morning when i was obliged to make my escape from the hotel de soissons her father fearful of the consequences if the count de soissons should march upon the capital had requested the Maréchal de chatillon then about to visit paris on the business of the army to send his daughter back to bern under as strong an escort as he might before put the maréchal upon his guard and the party who accompanied helen to the house of the old countess de marignon her relation at pau rendered all danger out of the question little more remains to be said for i was at length happy and happiness is silent helen shortly after was made my own by the irrevocable ties which to those who truly love are doubly dear from their durability in her arms i have found far more of delight and peace than even the dreams of my own imagination had portrayed or hope that constant flatterer had promised in her sweetest song twenty years have now elapsed and though time the slow destroyer of man's joys as well of his works may and probably will day by day rob me of some power or of some enjoyment for those twenty years i have known almost unmixed happiness this glorious past i may truly call my own and fate itself cannot snatch it from my grasp 
still however though memory has there its certain treasure hope runs on before and i look forward to my future years with tranquillity thank heaven i have learned as much content as is necessary to enjoyment and is compatible with activity and that spirit of adventure which was once my torment has now fallen asleep never i hope to wake again to you my son i give this history of your mother and myself and as i see in some degree the same spirit rising up in you that caused so much misery to your father let me before i lay down the pen point out the moral of my tale if you remark the various events of this story as they hang one upon another you will perceive that had i not suffered the love of adventure to lead me to the very brink of vice in the circumstances that occurred to me at saragossa i should not only have escaped the pain immediately consequent but the count de bagnols would have confided to me the secret of his own rank and helen's birth no motive for concealment would have existed between us my parents would have known all and approved all i should never have had to reproach myself with the murder of him i thought her brother i should never have been obliged to fly from my home i should never have been a houseless wanderer over the face of the earth accompanied by misery and remorse yet understand me i blame not enterprise i blame not enthusiasm it is the spring of all that is good great and admirable in existence but the art of happiness is to guide enthusiasm firmly on the path of virtue the art of success to guide it on the path of probability end of chapter forty nine end of delorme by george payne rainsford james